Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. She's celebrating her 75th birthday. She's a living history of New York City's politics of the last 40 years. She's been a leader in the movement to reform the Democratic Party, the peace movement, the women's movement. Throughout all of this, she has always spoken truth to power. She's Ronnie Eldridge, and she's here to talk about her life and times. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you're writing a book. Well, What's I'm the plot? To write Who's a book? the hero? I don't think there's a hero. Okay. No. Well. It's, a, it's a book for my grandchildren, basically. My mother kept a, a scrapbook, uh -huh. and I've never kept a scrapbook. So I decided I really wanted them to know a little bit about me and... Maybe I've learned some lessons in life, and maybe age brings a little wisdom. So I'm trying to write a book. But this, it's taken me a long time, and I'm only up to Robert Kennedy. So, Well, as a matter of fact, maybe that's where we'll start. Okay. This all started with a birthday invitation that says, Love, Ronnie. 75 and still connecting. Ronnie Eldridge's 75th birthday party. You've got this outstanding list of people announcing your birthday. Uh, your birthday is January 30th. Franklin Roosevelt's birthday, nice which birthday. is really basically, I think, what led me into politics. I'm not kidding. I mean, I was born in 1931. Roosevelt had just been elected president. My parents were big New Deal Democrats. I loved him. My best friend was the daughter of Republicans. Um, I remember 1936 where we, uh, I wore a, a Roosevelt button. She wore a Landon, Landon button. And it just always, I sent, I used to send birthday cards to the White House. One year they sent me one. So it's always been a connection to Washington. Did you grow up in the city? Yes. Where? I've actually, I've lived as, I grew up, I was born in a hospital at 82nd, I mean at 62nd and Amsterdam Avenue. It then became the Power Memorial Institute where Jamal, right? Right. Uh, uh, played Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. Yeah. Lou Jabbar, Jabbar, Whoever, whatever okay. his name is. Then we moved, my parents moved to 88th and West End. Wow, that's <laughs> 26 so blocks. So I have spent my life with a f exception during the Second World War between 68th Street, where I live, actually I lived on 67th Street before we moved here, and 93rd Street on the west side. Wow. I know every store on Broadway and what was there before it and before that and before that. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let, but, let, let's talk politics. But being 75, let me just tell you, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, this is, uh, we were talking before, it's an out-of-body experience because I certainly don't feel 75. I get a pang here. And yet, you know, Gloria Steinem, when she was 50, said, this is what 50 looks like. And this is what 75 looks like. It goes very fast. It goes, life, every, every little thing they say is true. I mean, life just, it flies, time flies. Do you still get up every morning outraged? This is what I love about Ronnie Eldridge, sense of outrage. The outrage is a little dimmed, but uh, I think that's because my husband is more outraged than I am. So. <laughs> that's right, and more outrageous than you <laughs> right. are on so top of it. it. Let's look at your political life. You really start in the 1960s, and you are one of the early leaders in the reform democratic movement, you know, the post-Stevenson I started Reform. actually earlier than that in 1951 wow. when I turned, to, or 52, when I turned, it must have been 51, I turned 21, I guess. My father walked me up to the local Democratic Club, which was the West Side Democratic Club, and it was basically the first Reform Club they had won in a primary. In those days, the petitions were typed, oh the Committee God. on Vacancies names were typed, and then there was a convention, and you were just elected. Um, the district leader was a friend of my fathers and his son went to school with me and I was I think the youngest member there then immediately they had a he Herb DeVarco he retired and they had a leadership fight and with these two guys and each one of them would invite people and and they'd have caucuses I didn't know what a caucus was so of course I went to both of them they all thought I was anyway so I started there and that was basically the first reform club I went to, I'm going to tell my whole book and I don't want to do that well no but come on and what you wait, do now when right DeVarco here. retired and we had the special thing, we went to meet Carmen de Sapio at uh -huh. Tammany Hall. Oh. Because we wanted to be able to elect the next, the replacement. And historically, he always re elect, you know, appointed them. 
So we go expecting this smoke-filled room with Carmine DiSapio, and it's an office building on Madison Avenue, and they even ask you not to smoke because he had bad eyes and right. they hurt him. So that was my first thing. Now, you became a district leader? I became a district leader in the, in the 60s. Uh, because by that time I'd run a couple of leadership fights. I'd had my own brush with patronage, which was really fascinating. I didn't realize it was patronage. I thought I was getting a job as a research assistant on the Joint Committee on Natural Resources. I learned all about Blue Point oysters and, <laughs> and the duck farmers polluting <laughs> Blue Point. Um, so I quit for a while, and I got married. And um, I had my first, um, I had Two ch one child, and then this is this is in the early to mid '60s. Supported a guy named Al Blumenthal for assembly at, at a new club called the uh, Reform Independent Democrats. And then you were so. And then I became a district leader. And then you very early on supported Robert Kennedy when right. the East Siders and the West Siders were at no, war the, with one the another. West si yeah, exactly. The West Side. West Siders were always more reformed than the East Siders, and the no, East Siders were sense. always more establishment. They were pro Wagner, they were pro Humphrey, they were very establishment. And this, these splits are real splits. I mean, people Absolutely. don't talk and they to carry one over in my mind still. So right. I don't know. Uh, anyway, we we had a, a congressman named Bill Ryan, and he had decided to run for the Senate, which nobody was too enthusiastic about. And so then we um, we heard Kennedy was coming, and we were delighted because he was an opponent to Wagner, who was the mayor, and we were trying to break it up a little bit. So somehow I became very, quite close to Robert Kennedy. Uh, and then that's where my, where the women's thing comes in. Go ahead. Because as, it's interesting, as I write the book, you know, I mean, and I'm talking about it as if this is really a book, it's just, it's a, but as I write it, I realized I was really a good person to have on your team, but I never thought that then, you know? How, and why I were you was a good so person? Surprised. Well, because I just, I, I am a good pilot. I'm good politically if you really want to know what's going on in my part of the world or what people like me think. And we're always thinking about change and stuff. Anyway, the Kennedy, it, Kennedys and I became very close. And Steve Smith, who was his brother-in-law who ran, I loved him. He was uh, a dear. And we just, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with him. And it became known that if you were had something and you came from the liberal part of the state or something, mm -hmm. you, you'd talk to me and I'd... Uh, you know, set up a date. I, I don't know. Somehow, I was always setting up dates or getting. I don't know, and I still don't understand it all. And then, and then you you went to work for John Lindsay early well, on. Well, I remember campaigning with Robert Kennedy for A. Beam in '65. Oh, I God. was with him one day, and he was campaigning. And then he was going to South America, I think, on a trip, or to South Africa. I can't remember. I don't remember which one. And he asked me that day because he was a Democrat. He was a Democratic senator, so he's supporting Beam. He said, do you know anybody other than John Lindsay who has charisma? <laughs> I love that. I mean, this is Robert Kennedy. So, of course, I was with, I was a district leader and I was with Kennedy, so I didn't support Lindsay in 65. Uh, then Kennedy died in 68. And in 69, early 69, I had been friendly with um, Barry Goddard. And Newfield brought, um, during the school strike, Jack Newfield, who used to write for The Voice sure. and was a friend of mine, used to bring Jay Kriegel around to talk about the school strike and decentralization. So um, in 69, with a mayoralty race, um, I guess it was Bar somebody, I don't know, uh, Dick Aurelio called me about two days before the primary. And I had not never met him. He was the campaign manager. He later became deputy mayor. And he said, we think we're going to lose the Republican primary. Mm -hmm. they, had, they were opposed by Markey. Was it Markey? Sure, yes. And and Procaccino, I guess. Well, Procaccino was won. the Democratic. Uh, oh, he was the nominee. Democrat, right. right? But was Markey on the ballot in '69? Markey then ran as a, the Republican. It must have as been. the Republican, and then Lindsey ran as the Liberal, and Procaccino ran, ran as, as the, the Democrat. Democrat. And in fact, weren't you involved in the effort to put together essentially a fusion candidacy on Lindsey's behalf oh, I, after I, he lost? Well, the, so Aurelia uh, said, "Would you? Can we meet you?" And uh, I said. Uh, I went down, I met all these guys, Dave, Garth, everybody, and I said, if, if Herman Badillo wins, I'll have trouble, I can't come. But if, if, if anybody else wins, I'd be glad to organize, help you. So I moved in and I was, uh, then there was another female moment. Uh, we used to call it a click, a moment of consciousness. I, I organized this thing, I put it all together, and Howard Samuels and my friend Ken Oletta, who will shoot me, used, because Ken Oletta used to work with Howard Samuels, right. used to come around and they'd say, we have to get a chairman of the Democrats for Lindsay. You know, they would bring around men who, I mean, really didn't know, you know, which way to turn as the chair of this thing. And they never recognized me as the chair. But fortunately, 
we, Dick and everybody else, did recognize it, that I was doing a good job and didn't need a chair, and we one never of, got a chair. One, one of the things I want to talk to you about is, is the role of women and the evolution of women in politics, because in a sense, you're a pioneer there. And at the same time, you're very involved in the political realm. You're also a mother and a wife with a family. In a sense, it gave women the opportunity to see a woman who was doing a traditional life in one sense, doing these other things as well. In fact, former Deputy Barbara Fife, a friend of, of mine and yours, said of you that, you know, you were a, a role model for a lot of women, which she also said. <laughs> okay. this, is, this is sort of the outside life of uh, Ronnie Eldridge. Quote, that you were the den mother for everyone in trouble. The phone rang at her house <laughs> continuously. People in jail, victims of domestic violence, people on the street, people in trouble, <laughs> the downtrodden in every respect of life. And then she went on to say, and that's still the case. Is there, did your phone still ring oh, like definitely. that? Definitely. <laughs> I befriended a, an emotionally disturbed young man in 19, uh, I used to see him hang out at Kennedy headquarters. This you know, isn't the person you married, your second husband. No, no. no. <laughs> These, you, you know, people who have uh, used to, when you had storefront operations, people, all kinds of people would come in, and people who were lonely and had problems used to hang around. Anyway, he was always around the Kennedy stuff. And then I saw him in the Lindsay headquarters, the campaign headquarters, and they were giving him a hard time. I said, this guy's a friend of mine. I still hear from him now. He's in a home. I knew his family. I got him into programs. He's now in a home in Woodstock. We go up to visit him. He calls us four times a day now, and we're his best friends, and that's since 1968. So, uh, yeah, they do. But um, I never realized I was a role model, believe me. Right. I never thought of that. Well, I mean, and you I've don't always, have to. I, and, uh, you know, it always reminds me of Peggy Lee. We were talking about that, that, that Peggy Lee once, they were talking about the big band era. She said, if I'd known I was living through an era, I would have paid more attention. And if I knew I was a pioneer, I would have paid more attention. Um, but I, uh, the Lindsay people asked me to come as, as to work for him after the mm -hmm. campaign. And I had been home with three kids and a husband who was a psychologist. And he was a Republican. And I, you know, so I went to see Steve Smith and I went to see other people. And they said, sure, you know, you can come. So I go to, to and I never met, I still hadn't met Lindsay. I was the head of the Democrats for Lindsay. But I had never met him. And I'm always amused when people say, oh, before I support him, I have to meet them and everything else. I think by the time you see a public figure, you know you're going to support them or not. The only reason you want to see them is, I think, because you want a deal or you want them to give you something, right? right? So I had never met Lindsay. And he did thank me on election night. <laughs> but I was upstairs with a headache or something. I don't remember. Anyway, I go to City Hall, to Gracie Mansion to meet him. And I, this is the story I concocted, and this is so indicative of women of my, you know, middle class housewives. I sa he said, well, what would you like to be? And I had to choke. I said, I'd like to be special assistant to the mayor. Fine. And what, ki what kind of money? I said, my husband says I need to make $25,000 a year or I'll have to come as an au pair girl. <laughs> Can you believe that? What did he say? They laughed, and of course I got 25000 a year, and I, then what I got a car do? and driver. I staffed health services and health and, and the hospital corporation for a long time, but I sort of roamed. I, I was the only Democrat on the staff, so they're right. The gays came to me, right? It was right after uh, Stonewall. Right. I, Mark Rubin was the first gay person to come to see me. I didn't, I don't know if I even knew what a homosexual was. I was quite naive. I mean, am I, you know, um, I became their, their advocate, and we got the executive order through, which prohibited mm -hmm. discrimination. Mm -hmm. I was the only person the young lords would talk to because they liked me and they didn't like the others. So I used to meet with Felipe Luciano, and I'd say, Felipe, you've got to get a permit. They're gonna, because they got arrested if they didn't have a street permit. They used to show a movie or they'd have a rally, you know, and they, then the, I remember the fire commissioner came and complained that they get stoned when they respond to a fire call. He's not going to go to East Harlem anymore. <laughs> So I said, you got to have a permit. He said, he thought about it. He said, you know, Ronnie, I can't get a permit. The streets belong to the people. So my office used to get permits for them. So we, but they started us on lead poisoning. And actually, that was a pet project of mine was mm -hmm. to do testing of lead poisoning. And it was a big thing because at that time, nobody paid attention to the lead content. content and you carried that through for I the next 20 years. And I was very proud. That's taught as a, as a, some kind of a thing at Harvard. Uh, school of Politics. Talk, talk about the peace movement. You were very connected with Alan Lowenstein. Talk about that and the feeling and, and, and the era as well. 
I'm trying to think of when that was. That was before, 65, 66. 66, 67, um, I was working in Robert Kennedy's, well, I was a district leader. Ted Weiss, who became a congressman, was in my club. We had never really agreed on politics. He was a little, I think in a funny way, I'm, I'm a more pragmatic politician than, than people like Ted who were, and Bill, I don't understand what it is. But we had the same views on issues. But I had a different way of expressing it. Yeah, okay. Can I, can I just interrupt for one second? And, and, and that is that when you really believe something, you go with it and you tend not to compromise. And that's both well, they the strength and a weakness. No, they don't either. They didn't either. No. But I did it in a different way, and I don't know what it was. Okay. Um, anyway, so we were having this race for uh, the Democrats. We used to have so many candidates, the reform candidates, who want to run against the regulars, that we used to have pre-primaries within the reform clubs. I mean, we spent a lot of money and time. Barbara Fife said you used to spend hours and Unbelievable hours and hours. To come up with one. At least we were smart enough in those days to know we had to come up with one candidate. Right. You couldn't have six candidates right. running. Right. So um, I decided to stay out of it because I had already tried it with a city council race with, for a woman, Estelle Carp, who had been a district leader, and Ted Weiss won that. And I, I wasn't thrilled with any of the candidates. So I, I'm a... Uh, Kennedy's office one day and the lights go out. That's the first blackout. Right. And it was a post office So you weren't allowed to leave So I got the staff to we I decided we'll call nursing homes and say we're from Senator Kennedy wanted us to call He by this time was in South America. He had left that day <laughs> Senator Kennedy wanted to call. Are you all right? And is there anything we can do and they were just floor You know, that was a great thing and everybody right. in the staff was busy and then finally when I could leave a guy named Phil Ryan walked me up to the bus stop cross town bus. I know Phil Ryan. Did you know? Yeah, sure. Anyway so I'm waiting for the bus, and along comes Al Lowenstein, who I had never met, really. And I think he had come to the house once, and I had met him. And was, so we spent the whole evening. And then another, this is a sideline, but this young woman was standing waiting for the bus, and she's laughing to herself. And she says, excuse me, but I have to tell you this. Guess where I've been for the last five hours? Where have I been since the lights went out? I said, where? She said, at my psychiatrist. <laughs> So she had five hours of therapy, and she was so proud of it. So what happened was the three of us walked home from 50th Street up to in the 70s. And, of course, I got uh, overwhelmed with Al's uh, And you worked in his congressional skills. campaign? So I ran that campaign. I was a volunteer. My, my wife's you? uncle was in Long Island. He was a Democrat. Oh, that's and a I different did, race. I did, no, no, you, you didn't York. do the, yeah. This was the New York race. Mm -hmm. And it was for the clubs, not, okay. not even that. Okay. And we lost by about six votes. We I had know. an argument with I the know. VID. I remember. With the VID, they didn't, the Village Independent Democrats didn't, they forgot part of their membership. I don't know, it was the whole thing. So it was a mess. So it was a mess. Okay. Then you went to Paul But Fox. he was you were quite at, something. Oh, I, I, well, I then, was extremely yeah. impressed. Well, and in, in fact, he was one of the dissenters of the anti-war movement in the 60s. Yeah, so we started with that. Then you asked me about the, I'm sorry, I know. Go ahead. I'm so fair. <laughs> I'm trying to get a light in it. Should have that. Go ahead. Talk fast. This is unusual, right? Yes. So Lowenstein loses, and then he realizes there's a race on the east side, and um, I didn't want to get involved. But yeah, Allard, those east siders. Allard was brilliant, but very manipulative. So he had me call. He says, "There's this peace woman over there. She's got the 17th action, the 17th congressional district peace action committee. Call her and talk to her." So I call her, it's Bella Abzug, and I had this vision of this old woman, like a, I don't know what, um, like Emma Goldman, sitting in a garret, right? So we talked about Al's running, and uh, I don't know what happened, but he didn't run. But then his brother owned a restaurant, Granson's, on Lexington Avenue and 51st Street, or wherever it was, and he used to entertain there all the time. So he called one night and said, we're going to have dinner with Norman Thomas, who had been the head of the socialist, right? right? Um, Frank Graham, who at the time was the president of the University of North Carolina, but he had been a senator and he was very famous, and Harold Ickes. Now, my husband, Larry Eldridge, who was terrific and young and everything, but was a psychologist and had no interest in politics, as I'm dragging him to this dinner, he says, what are we going to this dinner for? And anyway, isn't Harold Dickey's dead? Anyway, it was young Harold Dickey's. He was 18 years old and he was just back from the summer in Mississippi where he got beaten up. So that's the kind of life Al had. And then I met Bella. and. She was this beautiful woman, I mean, and this lawyer, and very chic and everything else. And she and I got together, and we devised a system for electing the delegates to the Democratic Convention in 68. By this time, though, we had started on the Dump Johnson. Al had started the Dump Johnson right. movement. And Sarah Kovner and I, in New York, became the co-directors of something called the Coalition for a Democratic Alternative. 
and we raised money for ads in the paper. And it started in California, the dissenting Democrats. They took out something like 10 pages of signatures uh, in the Los Angeles Times, and it just rolled across the country. So we raised so many, so much money and so many signatures that we had about four pages or something of signatures about ending this war mm -hmm. in Vietnam and not electing something. So it started a movement, and then Bella and I did this thing that, that you would, in those days you didn't run pledge to a candidate, that we would insist that the people running for, con for, the, for delegate right. would be pledged to a candidate. Right. And, I mean, we were very active. So you were involved in the, 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 the rule structure of the Democratic Party as well. That was later, yes. Oh, we wow. democratized, but we made a, I think we've made a mess because I think now it's unwieldy and impossible. But what was interesting about the anti-war movement was the passion and people's interest. And you look now at Iraq, and I don't understand it. I mean, what's happened to people? Why aren't they indignant? Uh, no draft? That's, I think you're right. I think that's exactly right. Rango is totally right. Uh, when I was at City Hall, it was during the Cambodian stuff, and um, uh, you know they we lowered the flag for the Kent State students, and the I hard lived hats this. I know. came and invaded. Well, my wife was was downtown marching Very scary. And during that that, yeah. that episode with the hard hats. And but it was that was different time. Every, totally. Yeah, it's giving me goosebumps. I don't yeah, know about it. It was right. so exciting and so incredible, and you really felt you were trying to have an impact. Okay, so then you then you moved in, you went to the Port Authority. Well, Kennedy died. Right. I didn't go to the Port Authority right away. Where did, where did you go? I went to Ms. Magazine. I went oh, back, oh, right. I went to the Lindsay administration. That's right, you were in the Lindsay administration. Then you, then and I worked I, for John Lindsay for president. And that, oh well, but the please. defining, what they call defining moment, I don't know what that means, it's such a cliche, but the, mo the thing in my life that had the greatest impact on me was the death of my husband. He was 42 years uh -huh. old. I was 39. I had three kids. I was working for John Lindsay, fortunately, because I had been a housewife for nine years. And Larry Eldridge came home one night, had a heart attack, and died. And it just changed my whole perspective because I had three kids I had to support. And he, he, didn't, he left things in quite a mess. Uh, my mother and father, my father died at 44. My mother was 39, and we had two kids. I, I, and I just, saw it at the other end. Right. And it... It, it just changed it. I mean, I wouldn't go and say, I need 20, you know, you have to give me, what are you going to pay me? Or, I mean, I became the head of a household, mm -hmm. and it was a very important thing. So it, it basically, it just was, it generated that. So I went, I went to work, for, I was still at work at Lindsay, then I left and went to the campaign, and I, I it was the first time I left the kids, and I traveled a this little bit. This is 72. Yeah. I remember my three kids came out. We had a lot of a, a wonderful babysitter and friend, and then somebody at home, and she they brought the kids out <laughs> to Wisconsin, the three kids for their for their Easter vacation, and they had great fun. But anyway, um, and then when I came back, I went back as deputy city administrator, and I and Aurelia wasn't there, and I then they start. It was a liberal party post, basically. Right. It was a real patron thing. And I was doing a good job. We worked on SROs and welfare and veterans' rights. I, I went did up a to Lexus West Nexus. I mean, throughout your yeah. career, all of those things yeah. are just highlighted. Really. But so I didn't like it very much. And right. then they appointed somebody and they took, they, they put him in over me. Joe Arazzo, you remember him? No. Oh, you do. You had to. He was a district leader in East Harlem. Then he became a, he was a liberal, but he became, well, anyway. Uh, and I wouldn't stand for that. So, so you principal. So I quit. I just and you quit. went, you went to Ms. And I went. But then, but then we got to move. I mean, we're, I we're, I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, this, this is part of the. We, we're only going to get into the 80s anyway. Forget it. So forget I don't even want to discuss. It. It. No, no, no. You ask me questions. No, no, no. <laughs> 77. You run for. Yeah, borough president. Borough president. By this time, I was a Dave Dinkins, uh, Andy Stein, and Robert Wagner. And Robert Jr. Wagner Jr. What I, uh, motivated you to I had gone from Ms. to uh, Channel 13 as the executive producer of a feminist series on PBS. And while I'm there, Percy Sutton calls me and asks me if I would manage his campaign. He was running for mayor. Right. And he had been the borough president. The only person running for borough president at the time was David Dinkins. And I thought, if Percy Sutton wants me to be his campaign manager, why? I mean, how can he do that? I'm just a nice little housewife. From Warwick. Right. They still hadn't gotten to that point. Why don't I run for borough president? So I decided to run for borough president, and Channel 13—that was a whole other thing. But anyway, 
And then Andy Stein and Bobby Wagner, who have been running for president of the city council, all dropped down to run for borough president. Mm -hmm. So when I thought I was supposed to run against David, I was running against the four of them. And you didn't win. I didn't win. I came in, um, I guess I came in last. I'm not sure if I came in last or if David did. David and I campaigned together, basically. He would say, if you can't vote for me, vote for her. <laughs> and, I, and I, in all modesty, think I was the best candidate. But, uh, no, that, and that, I had a very good quality anymore. job. I mean, support. Then you worked, at, then, then uh, essentially then publicly, then the next one is with Mario Cuomo. Then I went to the Port Authority, right. And then I went to Mario Cuomo. And then you did the, uh, the I women's I went to division. Mario Cuomo because of Jimmy. And then by that time I got married to Jimmy Breslin. Right. And, um, and then, so I met, met, I mean, I knew Mario, but then. Your impression? I love Mario, but it's taken me a long time. <laughs> Nice. And now and he's going to kill days. me. <laughs> nice. He's mad at you already. You know, I, I he, can tell him we to had. Uh, he's. He's. Uh, I know. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll do another. <laughs> no, we'll do. I, I don't want to get you into trouble. I love talking to him now. Okay. I love it. Okay. Then let's let's skip to 1989. And you I did a lot. The, the, we did the women's stuff. I, all the women's. And stuff. it was an interesting time for me because I've always believed there's a woman's perspective to public policy. There is a woman's way of thinking, and we do affect po public policy. I think. We're more sensible. We see the more common sense things. We see, we just connect differently, and we're more open, and we want to relate more to people. There is no doubt in my mind that we are different from the way men, most men, are in in government. We've got 20 more years in one minute, so I can't do it. Let's let's stick with this notion of men and and women in government. Your relationship with Peter Vallone, you're you're a council member. You get elected in Ruth Messenger's district in District Six in 1989. You had an interesting relationship with Peter Vallone. Talk about he thwarted that. every effort I made to do anything, because uh, I, I mean I want to change politics. I am, I'm. Outrage. <laughs> right. Right. At the way business gets done. Any place. I mean, we see it now with the lobbyists in Washington. We have the same thing here. And a lot of these people are my friends. But it is not a way to conduct the public business. Lobbyists have very important function. They bring a lot of information to us that we need desperately if you're a legislator and you want to vote on something. You need it. But you don't need the campaign finances and the and all that special interest. I don't know how you get that. I've spoken to Peter and I asked him, you know, who are your favorite council people? And Ronnie Eldridge was at the very top of the list. But he said that you constantly gave him agita. You were constantly at each other. But constantly, he always felt that you fought from the heart and you were a worthy adversary, but that you were a massive pain in the blank. So Mario Cuomo once said that, too, about me. <laughs> so, so, wait a minute. So There were two people who really appreciated me, Robert Kennedy and John Lindsay. I don't know. What can I and say? And everybody else thinks you're a pain in the no, butt. But this, no, this I don't think plus. Mario thinks that anymore. What? It is a plus. That's a yeah. plus. And this is why we love you, and this is why... <laughs> We I'm wish sorry. you a happy birthday, but before we end... I am sorry that I just rambled on. No, no, this is, this is what we want. At your 75th birthday, after you blow out the candles, 75 candles and one for next year, I, what are your three wishes? Three wishes. I, I wish I it could decide what I want to do with my life. <laughs> All right. That's good. You want any other wishes? <laughs> I hope that my grandchildren, I have six of them and five step-grandchildren, I hope that they all live in a world that's filled with peace and justice and happiness and good health. I hope so, too. Thank, Thank you. you.